Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is Nagi Mahashi. She describes herself as the voice, cook, photographer, and videographer for her wildly popular blog, Recipe Tin Eats. She is now also a debut best-selling author of the cookbook, Recipe Tin Eats Dinner. Hi, Nagi. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. <laughs> Con congratulations on the book. It is it is so beautiful. And you have been living the dream now for almost 10 years, right? As that person who ditched the corporate career, started a food blog, you started it with two visitors, yourself and your mom, and yeah. now you've got millions, but this is not some fluke. This doesn't just happen. You really had a plan. You made this happen. For those of us who have this dream, how did you do this? How did you make it happen? <laughs> a lot of hard work. <laughs> There's definitely no uh, college that you can go to for this kind of thing. Um, even it's quite interesting when I look at social media courses and things like that, that I see cropping up online, it's just, um, it, it's so difficult to say that that would actually apply to anything that I've done. Cause I think you, it, it's a, it's a new world out there. So, uh, a lot of it has just been testing the waters and figuring things out for myself and self-teaching a lot as well. So, yeah, but I think the main, uh, main main thing I say to people is that when I went into this I didn't go into it as a hobby um it is it is my number one love and I do ad adore everything about what I do but um I definitely went into it as a business and so I treated it like you would if you were starting you know a new business and I did a business plan and did my due diligence and figured out where my weaknesses were which was everything by the way except the eating part very good at the eating part and cooking part already but everything else hopeless photography videos writing on the what is a website I didn't know how to start a website so yeah just um the planning I guess is was a big part of it before I started and I liked, you've also said that you looked at where you felt you were doing something different that nobody else was and what the, what the user needs might be. So what was the answer when you asked yourself, what am I going to bring to the table that nobody else does? What was the answer? Um, there were two things. When I first started, I felt that there was a real lack of recipes online or good recipes online for uh, quick and easy Asian food. So the type that we really, the, the Chinese takeaway favorites, think Panda Express, but a whole lot less oil and a whole lot less sugar <laughs> and taste nicer too. But just um, really good, quick and easy stir fries and, and Asian takeout favorites. And the other thing was um, recipes that were actually properly tested and would work. So I myself have fallen into the trap so many times of um, the the perfect photo online. You know that photo that catches your eye when you're searching for something, and then you make it only to find that the you know the epic epic Easter centerpiece you were hoping for was a complete fail. So yeah, and I was that, really adamant. Yeah, that's what give, gives us the world, gives the world uh, nailed it, right? When you try and recreate those beautiful, perfect dishes. Yes. Like, nothing like that. Um, and you're also self-taught. Uh, for everything. Well, actually, yeah, even the cooking, because not even, yeah, my mom didn't even teach me to cook. So yeah, everything is self-taught. Photography, videos, uh, writing on the website, how to start a website. Didn't even know what a blog was when I first started. <laughs> so yeah, everything has just been self-taught. And the, and the cooking. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and the baking. Yeah. These are, you know, people go to school for any one of those things, Nagi. I know, but I always say I'm not a chef. I'm a home cook. It's just, um, I think I'm a little more persistent than most home cooks because if I make a bread or if I, any dish that I do, A, I want it to come out right and taste right, but B, if, um, you know, if it's what I consider to be a bit of a trickier recipe or there's a little, um, little, trick to it to get something particularly right then I'll test it a lot to get it right so yeah it's that I mean it is that like you don't have like a, a, a full cuisine you know a, a professional chef kitchen you didn't start with that you didn't start with a lot of sous chefs it's like this is what people are really making at home what yes. advice would you give to other people who are thinking maybe it's not a food blog but maybe it's something else maybe it's like but I want to do this next thing and I'm afraid I'm afraid of leaving that safety net what would you say to yeah. those people? It was scary. It definitely was scary. Um, I would say definitely do research beforehand and be honest with yourself about what your weaknesses are or areas of development are. Um, and you've got to have 
you got to have the passion because if you don't have the passion, you just won't have the drive to do it because yeah, for me, it was always about the food. So that's what was the, the fuel, if that makes sense. Um, and everything else was around how I was going to get there. So yeah, got to have the passion, but do the research and you don't need to go all in like I did. I, I was a little bit crazy. I left, you know, a good corporate job to do this full time, but you don't have to do it full time. You can start small. Mm -hmm. and see if there's potential and then gradually gradually move into a full-time yeah full-time position and millions of followers and now you're at this now you you have this other achievement this book tell Mm -hmm. me about the book how this came about how you wanted to out of the hundreds and hundreds of recipes that you've already created how did you curate this book what did you want the story of the book to be that was the hardest part. <laughs> there were so many. It was literally we were down to a final list of 300 recipes or something and it was trying to come down to that last 150. Um, to be honest, I ended up actually turning to my audience and I said to them, help, what do you want this cookbook to be? I'm trying to think of this angle, this angle. But it very much went down to my sweet spot, which is dinner. Um, and I really wanted to make sure it was mainly the quick and easy as well as just a handful of sort of those special occasion dishes um and and a couple of like one a couple of unique sections sort of master recipes so there's a there's a chapter called what i do with dot 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 i love and that it, yeah and then it's you know the basic what i do with a piece of steak so here's how i cook it and here are my my 10 go to steak sauces um, what I do with a piece of salmon. Here's how I make crispy skin. And here is my favorite ways to serve it. And it links back to master sauce recipes um, in the book. So yeah. Yeah. Cause sometimes you pick something up at the supermarket and then you take it home and you're like, what, what, what am I going to do with this thing now? Now exactly. it's like I've, I've, I've brought home an animal that I have to take care of. Like, what am I saying? <laughs> right. I love one of the things I really appreciate about the way that you write and the recipes that you do is you do keep it accessible. You do keep the ingredients accessible. You keep the techniques accessible. You keep the kind of equipment accessible. I want to know for people who are, whether you're new to cooking in general or new to your recipes, what are your couple of like just absolute ride or die hero ingredients that you think somebody should always have in their kitchen as the foundations of a good dinner? Garlic, butter, and wine. <laughs> garlic, butter, and white wine. Getting the pan is the best smell in the world. I know. Exactly. And if you've got those three ingredients, no matter what you've got in the cupboard, whether you've just got mushrooms or you've got some dried noodles in the pantry or a packet of pasta or a piece of chicken, whatever you've got, you can have dinner on the table if you've got butter, wine, and garlic. And that's all you need. Yeah, kind of true. Absolutely. And I also really appreciate that this book um, talks about leftovers because realistically food doesn't just magically perfectly end in the, in the meal. Tell me about that and, and about eliminating food waste and why that's an important part of, of your food writing. Yes. So every single recipe I was adamant, we had to deal with leftovers and just explain to people whether it was freezable or how long it would last in the fridge. Um, and yeah, that's really important to me because food waste is, a, it's a bit of a gripe of mine. And um, also the few, because mo- as you said, most recipes are very accessible ingredients you can get from any everyday grocery store. But the ones where I do ask people to go to an Asian store and get a jar of something, um, there's, there's you know, there'll be another recipe in there that says, I'll use the leftovers for this recipe. Um, so, and in fact, there's a handful of recipes in there that came about using leftover ingredients from another recipe in the cookbook. And so it was just like this ongoing cycle of, you know, (laughs) using the same ingredients over and over. So, yeah. Right. As opposed to this magical sort of TV moment where there's the perfect dish at the end of it. And then. Yes, that's that's right. right. It's it's self-contained. It's not, it's not like that. I also really like that there's a chapter that's about, even though everything you do is really, really accessible, really easy. Your whole vibe is like creative, easy recipes, simple. 
you do have a chapter where you get a little bit more ambitious. You know, you do the yeah. beef Wellington, you do, yeah. do some kind of bigger, bigger entertaining things. And I think for a lot of us, that can feel really intimidating. It feels, it can feel really intimidating to cook for other people. We can put a lot of pressure on ourselves. I love that story that, you know, Nigella Lawson's kind of origin story about going to a dinner party and the host crying in the other room because the host <laughs> wouldn't sat. And she's like, oh, we need help here. How do we, when we feel that kind of sense of performance and nervousness, what do you recommend we do to kind of put ourselves more at ease and feel more comfortable in the kitchen and more comfortable with the people we're feeding? Yeah, I think firstly, um, I always, my response is just to laugh because <laughs> I am, I'm probably the person that makes the most stuff ups in the kitchen. I bet I cook, I, I make way more mistakes than you, honestly. Um, most days I have more failures than successes and that's just the nature of what I do. So for me, I really, I always encourage people not to put too much pressure on themselves. And it's great to, you know, well, firstly, read a recipe from start to finish, but it's always great to push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone if that's what you want to do. But don't put the don't put so much pressure on yourself. For me, a lot of my recipes, um, in fact, I can't think of a single recipe where even if it doesn't go right, it's not going to be edible. It'll still be nice. It might just not be exactly perfect, you know, that we're striving to be, um, striving for, but they're still, still tasty. And, you know, even, well, even, oh, actually, well, here's something really embarrassing. I had a big deal TV show here in Australia, came, came to my house to do a, like, film a segment here. And the whole TV segment was about, or well, most of it was about the hostess um, decorating this Easter cake. And so, you know, there was a lot of airtime on that. And we had so much fun decorating it. And then the big moment came to cut a slice. <laughs> and it was really dense. And I had completely stuffed up the cake because I'd got the ingredient wrong and I pulled it out in the camera's and I was like, well, you can eat the frosting because it's delicious. But don't eat <laughs> you know what if if your meal ends with like a bowl of frosting that's still a good that's still a good exactly. day right a hundred exactly. I want to ask you there's so many um recipes out there that well the, the there's so many recipes in the book that are gorgeous but the one that really jumped, kind of jumped out at me was the roast chicken because everybody has thoughts about roast chicken everybody has opinions everybody has has advice on how to make the perfect roast chicken and you promise the juiciest, easiest roast chicken. Nagi, what's the secret? I know it's a very big call, isn't it? Easiest, juiciest roast chicken without faffing around with brining the day before or all these fancy tricks. It's really, really easy. You bake, It's pot roasted because it just seals in the juices. So it's semi-steamed. Um, so it's an old school trick and it does sound a little bit nannerish to say pot roasted chicken. So I just called it a roast chicken because really that's what it is. So you don't braise it in a liquid, but so it's roasting it inside a pot that's covered and then uncovering it to get some color on it. And then the other thing is you stand it upright when you're resting it. So resting any meat once you cook it is essential. But if with the um, chicken, if you put it upright, so the breast is facing down, then gravity takes care of all the juices in the chicken settling in what is normally the dry breast so when you cut it open and you can watch me do it in the video in the qr code that's on the on that recipe you literally have chicken juices like just squirting out of it it's so ridiculously juicy it's under every time i make it it blows my mind oh, blows my I, all right yeah i have to tell you i was looking through this book just like drooling and making really <laughs> inhuman sounds the entire time. So you're such an ambitious cook. You have such beautiful recipes. I want to know, is there any recipe that you're still, you feel like I just haven't cracked it yet? Like I just, I just can't quite get it right. Do you yes. have an elusive one that you're still chasing? Oh yes. Oh yes. And we have made it so many times. My team and I, I've even got a professional chef in my team and he hasn't even been out of crack it. Portuguese tarts at home. Oh, really? Yes. I don't know that it's possible. I, I literally don't know that it's possible in a in a home oven, but um, there's so many recipes with... online that promise the perfect outcome. And I've probably made everything on Google pages one and two. <laughs> I've had a, yeah, I've got my chef working on it. I've had a pastry chef in France who's my um, pastry teacher. She's had a crack at it. And yeah, I don't know that it's possible, but I'm determined because I love them and... <laughs> I can't afford to keep buying them to feed my obsession. 
Well, I mean, that's the great thing is you just have to keep testing. You go to the bakery, get yourself some Portuguese exactly. tarts, exactly. bring them home, go like not yet. It, what's the part? Is it the heat? Is it the, what is the? Yeah, it's the heat. It's getting the pastry crispy without the custard overcooking. Mm. Um, yeah. And getting that beautiful brown spots on the surface. But that's a really good example of even when it's a fail, when I say it's a fail, it's because the pastry's not quite crispy enough or the custard's a bit overcooked. It's still perfectly edible. And there are many people happy to take the leftovers of the Portuguese yeah. tarts. I, yeah, I got to tell you, I would I would not have a problem polishing off like a, I haven't like had a, a problem <laughs> like a so so Portuguese tart. That sounds exactly perfectly, perfectly fine. I want to ask also about you know you your whole mission in life is feeding people, teaching us to feed ourselves. But you also are involved in feeding people who can't who. Do, who are dealing with food insecurity. Talk to me a little bit about that because this is something that millions of us all around the world are facing, people who we may not think of and who may not look like they're hungry really are. Mm. Yeah, I have a, a food bank called Recipe Team Meals, which I started during the pandemic um, because it was very clearly an increasing amount of in, food insecurity in my area. Um, a lot of the food banks around here rely on restaurants to provide leftover ingredients and meals. And as you know, during the pandemic, most of the restaurants in around the world shut down for a period. And that was certainly the case here. Um, so I had an opportunity with a catering company that had shut down as a result of the pandemic to take over their kitchen. And, and so I decided to set up a food bank there. Um, so I have a team of three full-time chefs in there and they make home-cooked meals every day and we send them to a place that distributes them to people in need. So yeah, it's um, yeah definitely the thing I'm most proud of and something I secretly hoped I'd be able to do one day when I started my website. Um, so yeah, really excited that yeah I can do it. Most important part of my business, as I always say. So if something happens in the kitchen, you know, we, we and we do have dramas like there's a blackout or something or, you know, big grocery run wasn't delivered. Um, my team are very clear that no matter what else we have on in the business, everyone has to drop everything to get in there and help out if we need to, to make sure we get the promised meals out every single day. So we've never missed a delivery except one day when we had floods in Sydney so bad, we literally couldn't drive to do the delivery. So we had a car full of hundreds of meals and couldn't get the food to the people in need. So that's a pretty yeah. good record. Okay, Nagi, when you talk about your team, I think a lot of us are familiar with, we have a favorite member of your team. <laughs> the CEO. <laughs> the, 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 absolutely, the, C, the CED, the chief executive dog. I want to ask yeah. <laughs> about, about Dozer. He's such a big part of, of your connection with your audience. Was that something that was always intentional? It, I mean, it feels like his role no. is, so, is so interesting and so unique and such a, it's such a part of, I mean, he's on the cover of the book. I understand he helped you choose the cover of the book. Oh yeah, that's right. He's yeah, treading on the, treading on all the covers on the floor <laughs> in his way, shall we say. <laughs> It, it was uh, honestly it was a very organic thing um I think with everything and and you I mean you're a professional writer so you would you would know more than me certainly when you write um you've got that professional background so you can you can draw on your skills and your experience for me I'm not a professional writer so when I write and I put photos in um of my life or whatever's going on it really has to be organic if that makes sense like it's just my real life I, I just can't I can't make it happen. So I just started dropping in photos of him taste testing food going, you know, oh, I made this and yep, Dozo approves. And it was just a bit of a joke at first. But then um, people started getting really upset if there was a recipe I put out without a photo of him in there. <laughs> and, and then I just started. And then I remember there was one day when I got more comments about him than I did on the recipe. And then I realized that, oh, okay. So Dozo has become a bit of a thing. And then I even created a button on the website. So when you open a recipe, you can jump straight down to see him because people, honestly, the number of comments I get saying, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm sure the recipe is really nice, but I've got five minutes. So I just came in here to see what Dozer's doing. I just came here for <laughs> the Dozer. I'll come read the recipe one day. I love the like jump to, to Dozer. I have to ask you one last question. Do you and he ever have creative differences? Oh, no, because we both agree raw kale is really dull and that's pretty much the only thing we don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> that's Perfect. Nagi, thank you so, so much for talking today. What an absolute pleasure. Congratulations. It's already a bestseller in your country. Um, it's now coming out all over the world. Recipe 10 Eats Dinner. It's such a beautiful, wonderful, 
delicious looking book. And I can't wait to make the juiciest, easiest roast chicken of my life now. Thank you so much again for having me. That was so much fun. (laughs) Thank you, Nagi. What a pleasure.